Welcome. So happy to have you all here. I'm Kate Folb. I'm director of the USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center Hollywood Health and Society Program. And I'll give anybody an atomic football if they can repeat that back three times real fast. Um, but we're delighted to be here tonight partnering with Plowshares on this super interesting, uh, slightly chilling, um, but uplifting and positive discussion um, by an illustrious panel, as well as some in special invited guests that we have here on the front row. Um, I'm going to give you a quick commercial about Hollywood Health and Society for those of you who are not familiar with us. We are a nonprofit organization. We are part of uh, USC, but we uh, function as a free resource to the entertainment industry on all issues around health, medicine, science, safety, and security. We're here to support television writers and producers and other content creators to help them ensure that the medicine and the science that they're dealing with in their shows is as accurate as possible. And uh, that's with an interest in helping to inform our audiences and clearly not misinform them. Um, again, at, did I say we're free? It's a free resource. You can call us. We have operators standing by to take your calls. Uh, you can email us with a quick question for a script or if you want to connect with an expert uh, like some of uh, who you're going to hear tonight, um, we can do that too. We can bring experts into your writers' rooms. We can get them on the phone. We, you can Skype with them. You can telepathically connect. Uh, you know, many ways that we have to connect you all. But it's, it's free and it's in the interest of supporting you as writers to help you tell the story, the wonderful stories that you can tell, that only you can tell. And we can take some of the burden off in terms of the research and connecting you with the appropriate experts. So feel free to call us, email us. Like I said, we have operators standing by. And part of what we do is, is hold these kinds of events to put experts in front of you and maybe some new ideas in front of you to help you think about the stories that you maybe haven't told yet that you would like to tell. So we're here to inform and inspire. Uh, we've got a really exciting discussion tonight, and you're going to see some amazing panelists here in just a minute. But I do want to point out also, our, uh, we have some illustrious uh, screenwriter content creators in the front row that you also have their bios in your little packets. Um, but I'm just going to give a quick shout out to David Gray from Madam Secretary. And you have, they've done millions of other projects besides the ones I'm going to mention. So I'm, I don't mean to be limiting your uh, repertoire. Uh, Leela Bayok and Sam Shaw, uh, Manhattan, The Leftovers, Castle Rock. Did I get some of those right? They're here in the front row as well. Wave your hands or something. And Paul Redford, wave your hand, Paul. And now I've completely blanked on the show that you do. Oh my God, West Wing, oh my God. Okay, just West Wing, that's all. West Wing and a million other things as well, including Madam Secretary, right? You were on that. As, so, so these guys are here and they're gonna chime in on, on uh, some of the storylines that they've created uh, that have to do with the topic that we're gonna be talking about tonight. So, so thank you guys for coming as well. Um, quickly, if you're tweeting tonight, there's our hashtag, Nukes of Hollywood. So please uh, add the hashtag and tweet away. But please, uh, if you would, turn your ringer from your cell phone off or your Beyonce tune or whatever it is that it plays, um, just so we don't have those kind of interruptions. And um, lastly, but not least, um, thank you again for being here tonight. This is a really important issue, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Um, and we really appreciate you spending your Monday night with us. Um, we're going to kick things off with a short video that is going to remind you maybe of some movies and shows that you've seen in the past. They all have a similar theme, which has to do with nuclear weapons and or nuclear power. Um, but it'll take you down a little memory lane of, of the kinds of stories that have been told about these issues. And then we're going to, in our conversation, maybe talk about how we might be able to change up that narrative a little bit. So uh, let's roll the tape. <laughs> yeah. 
that's a cheery little beginning. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Joe Sorrentioni. I'm the president of uh, Plowshares Fund. And it's my pleasure to also welcome you here tonight. I know you all lead very busy lives, and there's a lot to do, especially in this town. There's a lot of challenges we face with our families, with our cities, with our nation. But of all the challenges we face, there really are only two that threaten destruction on a planetary scale, global warming and nuclear weapons. Global warming, warming can uh, destroy human civilization over the decades. Nuclear weapons can do it in an afternoon. Both of these are caused by machines we made, directed by leaders we elected, implementing policies we approved. So that means they can be changed. We can reverse the effects of these machines with new leaders with smarter policies. And for those of you who have been working on this issue for many years and are here tonight, I want to thank you for your service to your, the nation. For those of you who are just new to the issue, I want to congratulate you on your timing. Because you're coming at a particular moment in our nation's history where there's a new momentum for new policies, for new solutions to the nuclear threats and the climate change threats that we face. And the two are connected, as you'll hear in just a few minutes. And I don't base this on my desires, on my hope that finally it's a time that we finally solve some of the problems Hollywood has depicted so ominously. I base this on my analysis of what the trends are, of where we're going, of what we're doing, what we're seeing. So let me share those trends with you so you can decide whether you agree that this is a moment, a moment maybe where you want to get more involved in this than you intended to before you came here for the free food, drinks, and celebrities. Number one, the current U.S. policy has failed. It's not just a matter of who the president is. It's a matter of what his policies are. They have made every single one of the nuclear threats worse, whether it's leaving a, a deal that had contained Iran's nuclear program and was working perfectly and had been supported by all our allies, or it's botching a diplomatic mission to uh, Hanoi to get a deal with, with North Korea that was there for the making if they had proved competent enough to make it. Or it's leaving Ronald Reagan's Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, a treaty that Ronald Reagan negotiated to prevent a nuclear war in Europe. And now we have Russia and the United States building exactly the same weapons that Reagan and Gorbachev eliminated for deployment to potentially fight a nuclear war in Europe. These policies have failed. And in so failing, they leave a policy vacuum. They leave space where we can consider new policies. But where do they come from? Trend number two. The new Congress. The Democrats have taken over control of the House of Representatives. But it's not just that a new party is in charge. It's what kind of Democrats these are. A new wave of political figures has come in. A hundred women are in the US House of Representatives, the largest proportion, although still not enough, that we've ever seen. Of the members of the Democratic members of the House Armed Services Committee, half are freshmen. So these are people coming in, some of whom identify as activist leaders, meaning it's not just about the bill they produce, the statement that they make, but how they're connected to the movements outside, the people that brought them there, that elected this wave. And we see that especially in the chairmanship of the House Armed Services Committee with Adam Smith, the representative from Washington State, by far the most knowledgeable, most dedicated chairman I've ever seen, and I've worked for several of them, committed to, in his words, resetting U.S. nuclear policy. I'm telling you, we have never had a chairman of the House Armed Services Committee say that, and there's a lot of people in the House, like Congressman Ted Lieu, who were there to help him. In fact, were there before Adam Smith started introducing his bills. There's a flurry of legislation coming into the House and the Senate on things like canceling new weapons systems, preventing the funding for weapons that would violate any of our treaties, changing the US nuclear policy so that we do not, by accident or madness, launch a nuclear weapon first. The third trend, the presidential campaigns. That dull roar you hear is not just the freeway traffic. It's a dozen presidential campaigns starting up their engines, soon to be joined by more. There are going to be over 20 
people running for president of the United States. Many of these people have not yet articulated their national security policies. So what are they going to be? Who's going to inform them? Will they follow the leadership of some of the members of Congress? Will they be informed by some of the experts or some of the films that they've seen? It's, it's a unique opportunity to help shape a new policy with the mem new members of Congress, with the new presidential candidates. And that is going to be aided by the fourth trend that I see, which is the new mass movement. The largest demonstration in U.S. history had been the million people who gathered in Central Park in 1982 to protest nuclear weapons. That had been the largest demonstration in U.S. history, an anti-nuclear demonstration, until January 21st, 2017, when 1.5 million people marched in the Women's March. And for those of you who were there, you felt that this was different. This was not your grandfather or your grandmother's demonstration. There was a unity, a, a vitality, an energy, uh, and this is a word I learned that day, intersectionality to the issues that were there, whether it was climate change or reproductive rights or human rights or civil rights or, and you saw the posters, stopping a nuclear war, getting the president's finger off the button. You felt it. You saw it. Well, that energy has continued. Those people didn't go home. They went to work, and they're still going to work, and you're going to hear from some of those activists tonight. And finally, we have another trend, which is the budgetary crisis. This is the weakest trend. We don't have enough money, as Adam Smith says, to buy everything. I was just at a conference with him last week, and he says he freaks out his colleagues. And they said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, they want to buy as many weapons as humanly possible, and I don't. And so you see there's a budgetary pressure you're feeling on Congress now. Sometimes, and maybe that translates into restraint, into cutting the military budget, and if you're going to do that, cutting the nuclear budget. If you believe in the Green New Deal, what do you think you're going to get those billions to redo the grid, to turn to renewable energies. You've got to get them from someplace, and yes, taxing the wealthy can do some of that, but you're going to have to take it from some of the excesses from where we're spending billions that we don't need to spend, like the $2 trillion modernization program for new nuclear weapons. We are on track to spend $2 trillion on new nuclear weapons. You can take a lot of that money and move it over to something a lot more productive. You're going to hear all of that reflected on tonight in, in, our, in our speakers. But if you agree with those trends, if you see these things happening the way we see them happening, please think about joining us in this effort. Please think about participating one way or another, whether it's your talent or your money. Please think about joining this effort to do something about one of the two greatest global threats we face today. But enough for me. I've overstayed my welcome. I think I talked for twice as long as Elizabeth Warner wanted me to talk. So now can we bring this, the, the, uh, the chairs on stage and we can hear from our panel? I told you it was a mistake to give me the microphone first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just going to, um, you've got their bios. I just want to br bring them to the stage uh, pretty much in the order that they're that they're, they're, they're sitting, and if I have one more chair here, I'll bring up Ben Rhodes, a former Deputy National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. <laughs> Yasmin Silver, uh, community organizer from Beyond the Bomb, just got a resolution passed in San Francisco City Council against nuclear weapons, Ted Liu, the representative from Los Angeles, who's a sponsor of an important bill to prevent the, United States, the President of the United States from using nuclear weapons. First, Kenneth Benedict, the former publisher of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. She controls the doomsday clock. Be nice to her. <laughs> and Michael Douglas, actor, producer, UN Messenger of Peace, former Plowshares board member. And before... And I just wanted to recognize the deputy mayor of the city of Los Angeles, Nina Hajikian, who is our deputy mayor for international affairs. Thank you, Nina, for joining us today. And to coordinate all this is our de the development director from Plowshares Fund, Elizabeth Warner. Please welcome all of them. Thank you very much. Joe, Kate, thank you for a great welcome. Um, 
So you heard our great, amazing panel here tonight, our special guest. I want to give one final shout out as well to our Facebook Live audience. We are streaming this, so welcome and thank you guys for tuning in. Michael, I want to start with you. Okay, by the way, never in my wildest dreams was I on stage with this incredible panel. <laughs> Shh, that's just between us. Um, okay, so Michael, you are as we all know, an award-winning actor and producer. Um, uh, little plug, if you haven't seen The Kaminsky Method, see it, Netflix, do it. He didn't even ask for that. Um, and you live a really full and accomplished life, and yet over the last three, four decades, um, you have been an ardent advocate for peace and disarmament. And, um, I've heard you talk about this before, and I understand that part of it was uh, your experience with the China Syndrome, which we just saw the clip of, um, that opened, ironically, four decades, 40 years ago, uh, this past weekend. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us about what it is that got you involved in this issue, and maybe more importantly, what is it that keeps you fighting? What keeps you involved? Um, thank you. It's very nice to be here. It's honored guests and everybody showed up. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Well, other than in my, in my age group going all the way back, you know, I was of the group that um, was told when there's a bright light, you get under your wooden desk. <laughs> and, you know, I never quite understood what it all meant. You know, it, it just uh, I had this bright light. And then later on, my father bought a home in, um, in uh, Beverly Hills, and I was in my early teens, and I came out. And he had a bomb shelter that was in the in the house. He was the he was the previous owner. <laughs> Luckily, all I knew it was a great place to take girls, you know, <laughs> uh, growing up. So, I, I, but there was again that this, this this awareness. But it really happened with the China syndrome, and and, um, and I was looking at the China syndrome as a horror movie, you know, it was man against machine. And I was not that that involved with. I dealt some deal with, with the no nukes movement and Stephen Stills, what was going on. And as we were preparing our movie, there's a big finale in the end, and we had uh, two experts with us that were used to be G General Electric Quality Assurance doctor scientists who, who basically lost faith. <laughs> they lost faith, and they came over to the other side. Uh, and they were working actively with us on issues. And one of the questions became, well, what would be the sequence of events of a meltdown in the plant? And uh, what we did is we, uh, we had these people work out 150 steps. They're actually scripted steps of the whole sequence. And after the movie happened, then we had the whole China uh, Harrisburg situation that happened 90% of our steps in the movie were exactly the same as Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. And so that was just, what, 11 days after? 11 days after. Yeah. But, but it was just so, so I thought, that was like, well, if these guys could map out, they came from the other side and could map out 90% of the movie, what was going on. And then as I began to understand the half-life of plutonium uh, and, and the issues, and, the, and it became a never-ending story. Yeah. Uh, in the future, um, Thank God we have leaders like Joseph Sioni who's around. I mean, I, I, wor I worry most about apathy uh, right now. Um, I hate to admit it, but you know, in August, it'll be 10 years since Obama gave his speech in Prague. Um, and it's, and, and as, as, as excited as all of the NGO groups were and how positive everybody was working then, um, we've fallen off a cliff. We're going to hear from Ben about that later tonight. Well, and, and a message of hope, don't worry. Um, so, Kinnett, you have had a really long and distinguished career in the peace and security field, uh, most recently at the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And for those of you who don't know, the Bulletin is really the premier publication and public resource for information and discourse on uh, both nuclear war and climate change. And so I'm wondering if you could tell us about the doomsday clock. Evidently, you alone, according to Joe, are the <laughs> keeper. No, but, uh, but the bulletin is. And so tell us, you know, what is it set to? As far as I understand, it's the closest to midnight it's been since the Cold War. 
what goes into that? What are the biggest threats that we're facing today? Thank you, Liz, and thank you for the opportunity to um, be here tonight. Um, the the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has a science and security board, and uh, twice a year they sit down and talk about the threats, the trends that they see, and the dangers that we face. Uh, in January, they issued a statement which said that the clock, uh, the hand on the clock is at two minutes to midnight. That is the closest that the hand has been um, since 1953. Uh, the reasons that they feel there's so much danger are several. One, as Joe pointed out, climate change and nuclear weapons are really the two existential threats that we face as a planet. And um, of the two, nuclear weapons at this point, they feel, is even more a dangerous threat um, than, than climate change because it can happen, as Joe said, in an afternoon. Um, and they point to not only the North Korea troubles um, and to the U.S. pulling out of the uh, Iran deal, uh, but they also point to the fraying of the arms control agreements that we had put in place during the Cold War and the end of the Cold War. Um, the the uh, U.S. and Russia have now announced that they're withdrawing from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which is a treaty which banned a whole uh, set of weapons, as Joe mentioned. Um, and moreover, there are no negotiations going on. The um, New START Treaty, which helped limit nuclear weapons of our two countries, is up for renewal in 2021. And there seem to be no no real no talks, no communications, and these are complicated treaties that you need to get busy on if you're going to have success. Um, so the whole architecture of arms control is really uh, going, and what that means, along with the modernization programs, so-called modernization. Uh, some of us think it's a new arms race, but in the United States, Russia, China, UK. France, India, Pakistan, all the nuclear weapon states are engaged in this modernization program, increasing their nuclear weapons, increasing the, the, the lethality, the, the killing power of these weapons, uh, and the precision of them. And it looks to everybody like this is a global arms race that we're involved in. Um, at the press briefing that uh, the Bulletin did in, in Washington in January, Former uh, Secretary of Defense William Perry was there. And in the most poignant part of that press conference, he said, you know, I remember 1953, when the US and uh, the Soviet Union tested their hydrogen bombs within about nine months of each other. It was really the beginning of the arms race. And he said, and it's really that bad now, if not worse. So we have a lot to worry about. Um, and I hope we'll get to some solutions later. That's round two. Uh, congressman Liu, so uh, most people know you as the congressman from Los Angeles. But what they may not know is that among the many issues that you are fighting for in Washington, you really are the leading member, one of the leading members in Congress that's calling for a saner nuclear policy like Joe mentioned. Um, and, and he described really well that new momentum that's building, the new members, the policies. But I'd like to hear, uh, I think we'd like to hear from you directly, what, what is it that's most important to you right now? And you know, how are you leading this effort? And maybe how are you working with people like Adam Smith in Washington and Elizabeth Warren, other leaders in, the, in this issue? Thank you for your question. Uh, let me first say that having dealt with the Trump administration for over two years, I want to let you know what a throw it is for me to now be in front of normal, rational, kind people. Uh, so to, to answer the question, let me talk to you about a couple pieces of, of legislation. So I've introduced a legislation with Senator Ed Markey out of Massachusetts uh, that would restrict the president's ability to launch a nuclear first strike. So as many of you know, uh, the way we launch nuclear weapons in America is incredibly easy. Basically, one day the president wakes up and says, I want to launch nuclear weapons. That order uh, cannot be countermanded by the Secretary of Defense. It has to be executed, goes down the chain of command, missiles fly. Uh, no members of Congress are involved, no members of the judiciary are involved, no member of the president's cabinet even has to be involved. So Senator Markey and I looked at this and thought, wow, this is flat out unconstitutional. If you look at our constitution, the framers created entire 
Congress to put checks and balances on the president. They created create an entire judicial branch uh, to be a check and balance on the president. And then they gave the greatest power they knew at that time, the power to declare war to Congress. So there's no way that the framers would have allowed one person to launch thousands of nuclear weapons that can kill hundreds of millions of people and not have called that war. Uh, so our legislation is pretty simple. It basically says a president cannot launch a nuclear first strike without authorization from Congress. Uh, Chairman Adam Smith is a fantastic chair, and he has introduced another piece of legislation of which I am a co-author, I support it. It sort of um, uh, is an intermediate step. So our legislation would basically have a flat out legal prohibition on the president to launch a nuclear first strike without authorization. His bill would declare the policy of no first use uh, for America and he's doing that with Senator Elizabeth Warren. I think that's terrific. I would love to see that go through. Uh, at this point, I would vote for any piece of legislation uh, that would make our uh, nuclear policy saner. And then Adam Smith and I are also working on something called the Hold the Line Act. We sent out a dear colleague letter asking for co-authors. It basically would prohibit research, development, deployment of a low-yield Trident a nuclear missile. So. Um, that's some legislation we're doing, and thank you to Plowshares for supporting it, and also thank you to uh, Hollywood uh, Health and Society for uh, all you're doing tonight. Thank you. Yasmin, you are uh, probably one of the most passionate community organizers I know, uh, and before you joined Beyond the Bomb, you worked on other issues, human rights, women's rights, other social justice issues. So before I ask you about Beyond the Bomb, I would love for you to share with us tonight a little bit about why you made the jump to nuclear, and particularly because I think there are many issues that we care about. Each of us have probably a, a, you know, a set of things that we all care about. And um, sometimes we ask with nuclear weapons that this just be one of those things. And so I think for you to speak to some of that intersectionality, as Joe said, uh, will help people kind of find their place, right? So how did you find your place? Um, well, it was a journey. Um, I definitely didn't see it ending on this stage. <laughs> um, but it started back during the 2016 election. Um, and I was sitting on a friend's couch watching one of the presidential debates. And Secretary Clinton brought up the point that if elected, Trump would have unchecked access to the nuclear codes. Oh, is it on? OK. There you go. It's right in the mouth there. On a friend's couch, watching the second presidential debate, Secretary Clinton brought up the point that Chet would have unchecked authority over the nuclear codes if elected. And I stopped in horrified silence, realizing this is something that had never crossed my mind um, and yet would would impact daily life if it happened. And so while that was the catalyst, it wasn't actually until a few months later, um, I was working on preventing Trump from instituting the global gag rule. Um, so another foreign policy issue, working on it from American soil. And an old boss reached out to me and said, I know some organizers who are working on getting a project off the ground on grassroots movement around nuclear nonproliferation. Are you interested? I was on the phone, and I was like, hmm, let me do some research <laughs> and get back to you if I want to be put in touch. Um, and so I went home, and I started doing some research. And the more that I dug into the history of nuclear weapons um, and the legacy that that nuclear system has today, the more I realized that all of the issues I cared about, from gender-based violence to environmental justice, climate change, um, human rights, money in politics, is so influenced by the nuclear system. Um, and I realized that taking up this mantle now um, with Trump in the White House and at a moment when we keep talking about two, the two major threats, environmental, climate change, and nuclear weapons, so not only would I be working on issues that I felt passionately about and clearing those hurdles that the nuclear system have put up across the board for social justice issues we care about, but also working on preventing nuclear Armageddon. Yeah, yeah. just that small thing. Um, OK, so beyond the bomb. So uh, we heard from Congressman Liu a little bit about what's going on in Washington. 
Uh, but tell us, because there's so much going on outside of Washington, too. Uh, tell us what you're doing at really the state and local level. What's Beyond the Bomb doing, and what's the impact that you hope that that will have? Definitely. So Beyond the Bomb, um, we are working to create a reimagined nuclear movement for the 21st century. What does that mean? <laughs> um, it means that we're bringing the conversation to the folks who, like Michael said, didn't have those duck and cover drills when they grew up. We didn't grow up in the shadow of nuclear war. Um, and we, without that specter, how, how can we take action on something that has really been presented to us as something um, in the back halls um, of government with men in suits, not something for us to think about? Um, and so we kind of take it piece by piece and make it bite-sized for folks. Um, and so I think the first way to do that um, is to educate folks and tell them about the amazing legislation that is being introduced on the federal level and apply pressure upward. Grassroots is all about harnessing people power on a mass scale to affect change upward. Um, and so it starts at the local level. And so we're passing city and state level resolutions um, in favor of no first use and some of the other policies that we're seeing at the federal level um, to call on congressional delegations to co-sponsor and vote the right way on these issues. Um, because if we can get a city, Los Angeles is one of those cities, San Francisco is one of those cities that has passed these resolutions, then that actually snowballed into California passing that resolution, which means that the congressional delegation now has that pressure to go ahead and support the bills that Representative Liu is championing. Um, and so we are working to give people those opportunities to plug in in a way that is doable um, and make sense of an issue that for too long has been kept out of the public eye. Mm -hmm. So you're beginning to see this chain here, right? All these different channels of influence. Um, Ben Rhodes, I want to ask you, because you bring another perspective, really, from the White House. Uh, you were in the Obama administration, the deputy national security advisor. Uh, you were instrumental with the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, negotiations opening up Cuba, and even earlier, New START, which, um, Kinnett, you spoke about. So what did you hope to accomplish when you set the Prague agenda? And what are some of the lessons that we can learn from your time as we look forward? Uh, well, um, you know, I, I, with President Obama, wrote the speech he gave in Prague in 2009, which he laid out essentially what is the most ambitious agenda that we could have in terms of reducing and ultimately eliminating the threat of nuclear weapons. Um, and it was multi-pronged. Uh, one was just to take the next step in reducing the number of nuclear weapons that the United States and Russia had deployed, um, and that opens the door to reductions in our nuclear arsenals, uh, and that became the, the New START Treaty. Um, another was to stop the spread of nuclear weapons, and you know the next domino that was poised to fall in terms of another country obtaining nuclear weapons uh, was Iran, and so we spent you know seven years essentially trying to get to the place where we had an agreement where Iran peacefully agreed to uh, forsake nuclear weapons and to submit to uh, inspections and limitations on their nuclear program, which was important not just for Iran, but to demonstrate that there's a way diplomatically to solve these problems, um, that it doesn't need to be another war or it doesn't need to be an inevitability of the spread of nuclear weapons. Um, and so those were the kind of the two biggest uh, you know, achievements we had. On the other end of the spectrum, um, we had limitations on what we were able to get done, in part because of this nuclear infrastructure, this nuclear system that Yasmin was speaking about. Uh, Congress, in particular, um, you know, was very focused on not wanting to uh, cut um, funding for the nuclear infrastructure. And in fact, you know, it's a jobs program in some places. And so there's a kind of synergy between the Department of Defense and, and certain members of Congress that becomes a bit of a movable object <laughs> um, if you're trying to really pursue deep cuts um, in nuclear uh, infrastructure. Um, so we were able to, like a lot of things in the Obama years, we were able to move you know, the ball down the field, to use an analogy, uh, to reduce our deployed weapons, to, to stop the spread of nuclear weapons with Iran, but then we butted up against that, that wall. Uh, and, and frankly, it's gonna take members like Congressman Liu and movements like Beyond the Bomb combined with a White House uh, that can make that next push. And I will say that the, um, the one thing that you do learn is as dark as it may seem, you know, these pendulums can swing back, and they can swing back harder than um, 
uh, even b in 2009 when Obama took office, because you're, you're working from a different foundation. Um, I think the last thing uh, that I would just say to, to close the first go around here is um, you know, the urgency of this. I, I, um, the other thing that we did is we wanted to reconcile with some of the legacy of nuclear weapons in the United States. And uh, I went with President Obama to Hiroshima um, in uh, 2016. Um, and it was about as powerful a moment as I experienced in, in eight years in the White House. You know, we flew by helicopter into Hiroshima. Um, and if it wasn't already eerie enough to be flying over a city that the United States once completely destroyed, uh, I was sitting in, in Marine One with President Obama and Caroline Kennedy, whose father was literally the man who came the closest to having uh, to experience an, a nuclear war. Uh, and then landing in Hiroshima and driving in, and there are hundreds of thousands of people, or at least tens of thousands of people, greeting that, that motorcade. Um, and then sitting uh, and watching President Obama give this speech, literally in the middle of the city where I looked around and realized that every single building I could see didn't exist, didn't exist uh, the day after we dropped the atomic bomb uh, on Hiroshima. And what you realize, and what President Obama spoke about in that speech, is that unless the current trajectory has changed, this is going to happen again. Uh, there's an inevitability to the human impulse towards conflict and technological progress that leads to greater weapons. And we just take that for granted uh, in our daily lives. But if you look at the cast of characters who are leading nations around the world today, and you just project that forward 10 or 20 years, you project the nationalism that has reemerged in our country and in places around the world, that always leads to conflict. And those conflicts, it can, nobody thought World War I or World War II was going to be as destructive as they proved to be. Um, and, and so that really puts the onus on us as citizens to say that we're going to break this cycle of the inevitability of that conflict. And, and, and that, you know, that's what made me realize that even when I left my eight years in the White House that I wasn't going to leave this work. And if we can't stop the conflict, at least have it not include nuclear weapons. So, Kinnett, I want to come back to you. Um, one of the major debates that's going on right now in the field is um, really around secrecy of this field, the secrecy. I, th I think, uh, Yasmin, you were talking about it as well, uh, how much goes on behind closed doors um, in setting these policies. So, and, you know, people are looking at restoring democracy and, and taking back control of how we as a country, we as citizens, define security. And you wrote an essay uh, recently, and you went even further, and in it you said that democracy and the bomb are incompatible. So uh, what do you mean by this, and how can we, as citizens and as elected officials, how can we participate in these decisions about our security and nuclear weapons that will inevitably impact each and every one of us? Uh, thanks, Liz, for the question. Um, yeah, democracy requires political participation. It assumes that we are equal, that we have a vote, uh, that we have influence over policy, that we get information that we can use to make decisions and choose among candidates. Um, and we do on a number of issues, education, tax policy, health care, pre-existing conditions, whole range of things. But when it comes to nuclear weapons, one person, the President of the United States, has the sole authority to launch those weapons, as we've heard, and destroy another society and put us at enormous risk. So in a sense, we live in a thermonuclear monarchy as one scholar has put it. Um, the secrecy that surrounds nuclear weapons is quite extraordinary, and it's really the only policy area in which we have so much secrecy. We, the government, U.S. government doesn't publish uh, right now, it did in the Obama administration, but it does not publish how many nuclear weapons we have, what the war plans are, what the consequences of those war plans might be. So we're really in the dark. and. In a sense, the result of this is that we are children. We're wards of the state. The government has decided what we can and cannot know about the most consequential decision that a country can make, whether to go to war and whether to go to nuclear war. 
So we are in a pickle. Um, we think we have a democracy, and to some extent we do, but I guess what I'm arguing is that we will not have a full democracy until we can take, uh, as citizens, take greater control of this extraordinarily dangerous technology. Now, citizens haven't always acquiesced to this. Uh, in fact, we've seen um, citizen movements in the 1950s, uh, which brought about the, uh, arguably, the 1963 Partial Test Ban Treaty, atmospheric testing was stopped of nuclear weapons. And then in the 1980s, the Freeze Movement was another such movement. Uh, and again, arguably, led to the end of the Cold War and, and extraordinary reductions in nuclear weapons. And today, we see another citizens' movement of non-governmental organizations working with the United Nations that have put in place a treaty that calls for the banning of nuclear weapons. So citizens have, when they have been blocked in the normal channels, get out in the streets, they go be outside of the normal political channels to make things happen. But I think there must be a different way. <laughs> Do we have to depend on organize, organized protest, civil disobedience, and putting your lives on the line in order to have a kind of conversation and debate about nuclear weapons? I think not. I think we need to demand information. We need to demand that the veil of secrecy be drawn away from the nuclear weapons. We need to have information. We need to have debates about nuclear weapons at every uh, in every single uh, presidential race, um, every governor's race, uh, every state legislator's race, uh, every mayoral race. And the Congress now, thanks to Representative Liu and Senator Markey and several others, now looks like they are interested in taking some control over this issue. And I think that's a tremendous step forward. It's actually the most positive <laughs> uh, movement we've seen in a long time. So that we begin to what, regularize our discussions about nuclear policy and move towards what you might call nuclear democracy. So I'm very hopeful about this moment, but I think it's important to understand that all of us need to participate. Um, I go to, I do public speaking and oftentimes the question, someone will raise their hand and they'll say, I'm not an expert on nuclear weapons, but we are all experts on nuclear weapons because we are all gonna be affected by those nuclear weapons. We have a lot at stake. Each and every one of us has something at stake. So it behooves us to learn as much as we can, demand that our government give away, its, give up its secrets, and for those of us who, because of gender or skin color, have been locked out of all sorts of decision-making uh, roles, um, and who may understand even more what being wards of the state might mean, I think it's particularly incumbent on us to show the way, to show that we need to participate and be counted on and counted when it comes to our nuclear weapons policy. Yeah, you don't have to be a nuclear expert to raise a question. Thank you. Um, Congressman Liu, building on what Kinnett's talking about and democratizing the system and having it work for the people, what do you see possible over the next few years? And you know, what progress can Congress make on nuclear policy and how can we support it? I, I think Kinnett is right. We need to absolutely educate the American people more about these issues. I believe that Abraham Lincoln had it right when he said that public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And so part of what we're trying to do is to get public sentiment uh, onto the side of having a saner nuclear policy. Uh, so you might wonder why I would introduce this legislation with Senator Markey knowing that we've got a Republican-controlled Senate that is unlikely going to ever pass this bill. And it's my view, uh, first of all, that everything seems impossible to what happens in politics. So if 10 years ago I were to tell you, hey, in 10 years we're gonna have gay marriage in 50 states and some of those states would be smoking weed, <laughs> you would have thought it was crazy. Well, that is exactly what we have right now. Uh, so you never know, so you just keep on pushing. And I've introduced this legislation every term. We uh, didn't actually target Donald Trump. We introduced it when Obama was president, when everyone thought Hillary was gonna be the next president. We simply thought, there's a constitutional defect in the way we launch nuclear weapons. But another reason we introduced legislation is so that 
folks can use it as a tool to try to educate people. So what Yasmin does is great, and we've gotten cities and states to pass a resolution supporting this legislation. Uh, plowshares is great and, and inform the American people. But there's another reason we do it as well. And so I'll tell you this story. I was I had this amazing opportunity to be on Air Force One with President Obama. And I remember uh, halfway through the flight, I was talking to this military officer, and uh, I was chatting with him, and I asked him what he did. And he said, oh, I'm the military liaison for the president. I said, oh, okay. And then about five minutes later, I said, what is that? Um, and he said, on a very, very bad day, I am needed. So he's basically the guy that deals with nuclear launch codes, and wherever President Obama was going, he was going, I think, to a late night talk show that, that day. He was going to be sort of near him in the hotel room and near him wherever he went. And so one of the reasons we did this legislation is uh, your missile launch officer down in the silos, they're just going to execute once that order comes down. But before the order comes down, you've got some generals up there, right, who might be thinking, huh, we just want to plant something in their minds. Maybe this isn't constitutional. Or the person with the nuclear football, right, who's looking at the president, maybe he might think, is this actually the right thing to do at this moment in time? So we want to be able to also do that with this legislation. Uh, so uh, again, it's public sentiment. It's just try and get people to think about these issues because most Americans don't walk around thinking about nuclear policy. We want more people to walk around thinking about that issue. Well, Yasmin, maybe if you're effective, everyone will be thinking about these issues. Um, so I actually want to pose a similar question to you. What's your vision for the next few years, right? We're starting to turn to this future now, and what's your vision, what's beyond the bomb's vision, and how can we as citizens play a role? That's huge, but in an amazing way. I love blank canvases because it opens the room for so much possibility. Um, I think in the next few years, really, um, given all of the momentum that we're talking about here, we would love to see a no first use policy passed. We would love to see us begin renegotiating New START um, to re-enter the Iran deal, um, to renegotiate some of these treaties so that they make us safer in America. And I think that that's totally possible. And the reason I do is because I'm sitting in a room full of people who on a Monday night have come out to learn about how they can get involved. <laughs> um, every day I, I talk with everyday people who have no background in this issue generally. And the one thing that I can say is, since I joined the nuclear space about two years ago to today, there is such a heightened understanding of this issue. Maybe not the wonkiness, maybe not what different yields mean, but that this issue is real, um, it isn't this intangible, um, and that there are options on the table. And so what can people do? Um, any little action helps. Um, so at Beyond the Bomb, some of the ways that we plug people in um, is having you call your representative, whether they're already on our side to say thank you and to keep them in this fight, whether they just don't realize that there are options on the table like the bills we've been talking about and to get them to sign on, or whether they're opposed and we just need to get in their face and tell them that it's time that they change their mind because as I think Kinnett said, we all have a stake in this. It's not just the people who have the knowledge, everyone would be affected by a nuclear war. Um, and so reach out to Beyond the Bomb. We're here to help, reach out to, there are so many people in this room who are part of organizations locally. We're in a coalition um, with about six to eight different groups across the country. Um, every little thing helps and plugging in uh, and taking that first five minute step, whether it's clicking a donation button um, or writing an email, will get us one step closer um, to sh educating our, our fellows on this issue and, and educating our elected officials to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You're here. Um, Michael, we have some pretty influential people here in the room tonight, including you. Uh, and writers and showrunners and people who really have the ability to um, reach and educate and raise awareness, you know, millions of people across the country and around the world. Um, so tell us a little about what role that you think Hollywood can play in this effort. You know, we've heard from elected officials and citizens and, but 
we're here tonight with a lot of Hollywood folks, so what can Hollywood do? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. uh, hopefully entertainers. That's got to be uh, yeah. number one. I think we've all made the mistake of learning of, of important issues that we felt were very important but didn't have any characters mm -hmm. for the story uh, be behind uh, to, to tell them. Uh, and, I, and I think I, I think there has to be other, other ways that it will. That, that sometimes you think it's already been told. I remember when I was trying to do one one of the cuckoo's nest, and everybody said, well, "Who wants to see another snake bit?" Yeah. You know, yeah. and I said, "Yeah, you're right." And then I found out later on, snake bit did very well. <laughs> it, it, it did very well. So I think there's a. Um, um, it, it's really hard because ultimately, w why has the climate change moved so much? I think it's moved so much because now a pictures worth a thousand words, and we're seeing p examples of huge pieces of glaciers dripping off and this and that. We're seeing water levels going up. It's a really visual it's issue. It's a very strong visual I image. I've, I've thought of this as almost as if you want to have a, a one-time right to have an, a, a thermonuclear explosion. I know we've seen pictures of them in, in the past, but to really quite understand, conceptually understand this, this force, this power. Um, I think the fact is that we've been late to to, you, to joining our, ourselves um, uh, to the climate change movement. I think there's, there are, you know, one hand. And ironically, this is the two major issues that humankind can change, can adjust compared to a lot of other um, you know, situations. The, the, this, 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 this issue, besides the complexity, always comes down to, well, there's nothing I can do as a citizen. This is government's job. And so you have groups like NTI, who Sam, Sam Nunn, who has a fabulous job, it works at a much more of a governmental level, which excludes a lot of the NGOs and all of that. So it seems to me that this has to become a rallying cry for like the next election. Uh, this has to be issued, this has to be brought up, all the grassroots work that's being done. I'm so happy to see how much more synergy there is between the different groups. Um, not competing for those uh, those uh, dollars, but finding ways to balance um, out. But I, I think it's it's to try to alert individuals um, to, to to vote uh, and not have to wait for not wait for government. Yeah, yeah government created this problem. They're not necessarily going to solve it. So Ben, last question to you before we we turn to the audience. Um, do you think that we're going to have another chance for progress? Do you think that this synergy that we're talking about here tonight is going to move beyond this room? Is there a little glimmer of hope that you see having been in the administration and, and been in it the way that you were? Yeah, I mean, I, um, it, it involves intersectionality, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, uh, I, I, just hearing people talk, a couple of additional points came into my head about the stakes and how distant they can seem from people. Because the key is to make them feel less distant. Um, one is just a very small thing, you know, on the list of things that the Obama administration did that I think were good, we had a, an effort to secure nuclear materials around the world. And uh, as a part of that, early in the Obama administration, we were able to get all the uh, nuclear material, the enriched uranium, out of Ukraine. Which seemed like just a, you know, a nice little small thing that we did and nobody paid much attention to it. When a war broke out in Ukraine a few years later, um, we were pretty happy. There wasn't a bunch of raw material that could be used to make a nuclear device there. I, I, again, it goes to show you the stakes uh, of decisions that are made by people in office. Another one, in listening to, to Ted Lieu talk, I used to be often uh, the National Security Council representative who traveled with President Obama all over the world, all over the country. Uh, and what did that mean? That meant, in part, that I rode in this armored SUV with that guy. And there was a black suitcase that I got very accustomed to being between me and that guy. And I looked at it and realized, you know, those are the nuclear codes. And I was riding in the car that would get the phone call um, if, God forbid, there was some decision like the one we saw at Dramatize. And it's very anodyne. You're sitting in a parked motorcade for 45 minutes while Obama does some event. And look, I knew that if something like that happened, he would be judicious and we'd have a process and he probably would consult the you know, congressional leaders and 
But right now, John Bolton is riding in that car. Um, and I can tell you, the North Koreans you know, shell some South Korean ship and it sinks and the South Koreans get a little trigger happy and they fire back and then the North Koreans launch something and within an hour, um, that phone call could be coming to John Bolton. Um, and I don't think this crowd is gonna show restraint. Um, this can happen like that, you know. Um, that's the, the problem. <laughs> um, the opportunities you said is that there is a, a swelling civic activism that is intersectional, that, that sees the interconnectivity between different issues. Um, very important that we talk about things we mentioned tonight, like no first use and, and sole authority, but the, the glaring blinking red light is also the fact that our government is planning to spend trillions of dollars to develop new nuclear weapons that we don't need uh, and that will just make life on Earth more dangerous. And as Joe said, and I've been a broken record on this, if you want to pay for the Green New Deal, if you want to have mass mobilization in order to prevent the, the, the one apocalypse over here <laughs> that involves climate change, here's the money. I mean, it's just, it's, it's glaring that we just don't need to spend this money. We don't need to spend it. And, and people will give you all the reasons why look, even if you believe in nuclear deterrence, we don't need to spend this money, right? Um, and so I think if people can start to see the interconnectivity between solving some of the problems that we do have and not spending money on something we don't need to, I think that's a huge opportunity to kind of open up a new space for this type of nuclear debate in a way that, uh, you know, I wish, you know, we had earlier in the Obama administration. Um, I think now there's a greater, you know, mobilization around the connectivity between issues. I think the American people are much more frustrated than they were even 10 years ago about war. Um, and that's a bipartisan frustration. That the only thing that Republican and Democratic voters seem to agree on is that they're tired of this forever war. So you take this combination of the fatigue with war, the fatigue with the inability to find resources for things that really matter in this country, uh, the, the, the person who can articulate that vision um, you know, has a huge opportunity, I think, to do things like Congressman Lou said that might seem difficult or impossible now, but in five years from now, you know, we could be living in a very different world and having a very different conversation. The one thing it's gonna take, though, is organization. If you look at where we are today, this was not by accident. In terms of, if you look at how the right wing in this country and, and around the, the, the world, uh, particularly in the West, has organized, and has shared common political strategies and common media strategies and common sources of financing. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's just something we've watched with our own eyes for 20 or 30 years. A small number of people uh, use a pretty small amount of resources, a few billion dollars, to essentially completely change the way in which elections are held in this country, change what the priorities are in this country, change the judicial branch of this country. It's on us to organize from the other side. If we do that, there are more of us than them. There are, there's more money on this side, there are more people on this side, there's more energy on this side. The problem is sometimes people, they get apathetic or they get cynical about the capacity to bring about change. Um, and it, that's exactly what the Trumps of the world and the Koch brothers of the world, that's what they want. They're counting on apathy and cynicism. That's a recipe for them winning. Uh, if we can mobilize on our side, uh, then I'm more than confident that we can make this pendulum swing back much harder than it did before. But it is gonna take everybody playing a role. It's gonna take citizens playing a role, members of Congress playing a role, people in foreign policy playing a role, people in the entertainment industry who are the portal through which Americans hear the stories about themselves and the world that they live in. It's gonna take all of us playing a role, and if we do it, then I'm very confident we could be sitting here in a few years having an entirely different conversation. Yeah, thank you. So, before I open up, uh, think of your question while I ask a two, couple more questions of our audience down here. Um, so I want to bring some of the writers and producers into this conversation who have already included nuclear theme storylines, just so you can hear how uh, some of these folks are already doing this. Um, so my first question is for Sam Shaw and Leela Bayak. So you created Manhattan. And uh, 
you know, this is a show about the veil of secrecy and the really bizarre world of the scientists who um, were creating the bomb in Los Alamos in the 1940s. So I'd love to hear from you, why was this story, this origin story of the bomb, why was this so compelling for you to create a whole show about it? Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for including us, by the way. Um, so Will you stand up? Oh boy, okay. I'm being hi. told by Kate. Just, just once or throughout? <laughs> it would be, okay. Um, so, hi. Uh, so Manhattan was the first show that I created, and so I had a luxury um, that you probably get once in your career where I got to work on it and research and think about it in hermetic isolation in my apartment in Brooklyn for about five years before it ever existed as anything other than a thing that I would talk about at parties. Um, and, uh, and it actually, um, it began as a very different project. It began as a show about a different war in a different era. This is not a creative process that I recommend to anyone. Um, but uh, it started as a project about the war on terror. Um, my dad was a criminal defense lawyer and when he retired, he took on some uh, pro bono cases, including the cases of uh, a couple of detainees at Guantanamo. And I was really fascinated by that experience that he had, in part because there was a lot he couldn't tell me about it. Um, and so it sort of suggested a project about secret work and about what um, the burdens are of secret work and what secrecy does to a person and a family and a country. And um, for a whole variety of reasons, I was sort of disabused of the idea that that was the project I was going to write. For one thing, I think it's really hard to write about history before the ink is dry with any kind of moral clarity. Um, but I found that when you start to research uh, the security state and, and issues of national secrecy, it's sort of all roads lead to New Mexico. And more and more it came to feel like the story of the Manhattan Project was kind of this great origin story for the kind of American superpower heyday and a story that explained a whole lot of challenges that we're still trying to reckon with now from the sort of you know, trade-offs between freedom and security to the politicizing of science. Um, you know, it was also kind of the birth of the suburbs because Los Alamos became a kind of a template for Levittown. So that idea that sort of the apocalypse and you know, the Cold War American suburb were twins in the same womb, like what could be more fascinating to write about than that? Um, uh, so in any case, that, that was sort of the genesis of it. In a way, um, uh, it was an accident that um, the issues around nuclear weapons and nonproliferation, which I came to care about a great deal, um, were sort of the air that we got to breathe writing the show for a whole bunch of years. And, um, and it, it felt, um, look, we saw the show, you know, as Michael said, you have the characters and we saw it, it was sort of a moral thriller about people grappling with really complicated moral questions. Mm. Um, but uh, to the extent that it was possible to try to make a conversation that I think is usually very abstract and very abstruse, and by the way, not accidentally, I think some of the sort of codes and strictures of secrecy that were part of the construction of the Manhattan Project have been metabolized by the country and they account for the fact that we still don't really know how to talk about these issues. And there is a real learning curve where you, uh, you feel that a lot of people feel they're not, um, they're not informed in a way they need to be to participate in the conversation. But um, you know, as you say really articulately, it's our issue. So um, anyway, it was a privilege to be able to tell some stories about those subjects, which yeah. I care about a lot. Well, and thank you for that series. Um, David, so you have also gone really deep into the nuclear issue um, with Madam Secretary, and it was great when I was down here a year ago hanging out with you and just hearing like how you have really embraced this issue and the details and the challenges that it presents. And um, you know, you've included several episodes for Madam Secretary, including the Doomsday Clock, and you had a, your own Iran nuclear agreement, um, conflict between India and Pakistan. And then there was the clip that we saw tonight, which was about that hair trigger alert and that whole challenge that uh, President Dalton, or our president, has that they have to decide within minutes, just minutes, how to respond to hundreds of incoming nuclear missiles. So I know that you did a lot of research for that, um, that episode, and I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit about that and uh, maybe something that surprised you about kind of the command and control system that you didn't know about. Sure, absolutely. Hey there. Uh, so first of all, I'll say that that episode in particular um, uh, about the nuclear hair trigger 
uh, you saw the clip in the helicopter, that was a perfect example of why groups like Hollywood Health and Society are so important. Uh, because if not for Hollywood Health and Society, we wouldn't have done that episode. And 10 or 12 million people or 15 million people by this point wouldn't have learned about that issue like we did. Um, Joe Cerincioni from Plowshares um, came to our office because Roberta and or Kate said to us, you know, you should meet Joe Cerincioni. And he brought some of the foremost experts in the world on the subject of nuclear de-alerting with him and talked to our writers about it. Uh, Roberta also said, you know, you should meet Ernie Meniz, uh, Secretary of Energy, and talk about uh, the nuclear, um, uh, the Iran nuclear deal. And he also talked to us about de-alerting. And man, did we, there are a couple of us, including me, that we wanted to, man, that sounded so exciting. What if we put that on its feet? You know, and I wanted to end the, the teaser, like the first act of the show with, we launch, you know, we launch nuclear weapons. And uh, we launch, uh, because there's gotta be a way to take it back. And, um, <laughs> And uh, no. I talked to Joe, and I talked to um, Bruce Blair, who's the foremost expert in the world on, on de-alerting. He was a missileer himself, worked in the silo for a couple of years. And as I was talking to um, uh, to uh, Kinnett earlier this year, we haven't researched any episode more than we did that one. And finally, I had to say, oh, darn it, we can't. We can't launch. It would have been exciting. At the, you know, we launched a nuclear war. Um, but we came up with a scenario. Uh, based on something that had happened uh, back in the 70s uh, when someone, not quite Ben wrote, but Zbigniew Brzezinski, the, um, who was the, um, the, uh, the, the, who was the national security advisor, you know, got, got, the two thir got the middle of the night phone call uh, that the Russians had launched the kitchen sink uh, at the United States. And he almost called President Carter until they realized at, at uh, I guess it was NORAD back then, now it would be Stratcom. But the general at NORAD, who actually called, he decided, yep, the, the Russians launched, you know, thousands of nuclear bombs are gonna be landed in our cities in about 25 minutes or half an hour. Um, and they called the national security advisor who had no other information to go on other than what NORAD was telling him, the general at NORAD. And he didn't call, the, he stayed on the phone though, and they figured out, oops, uh, between shifts, uh, simulation had been triggered. Uh, and it was, the simulation was really good. Uh, it was convincing. And, uh, and so that, we decided to go with that scenario, where what if there was a simulation? And the way we got out of it was, because in that scene in the, hel in the helicopter, what you didn't see is that President Keith Carradine uh, ordered the launch of major attack option one. And the way we got out of it in the world of our show, and this was talking to our advisors, is what if the guy in the Pentagon, the person in charge in the Pentagon war room, the general, lost his clearance in the moment right before he had to send the codes uh, to the nuclear, and he lost his clearance. Then you'd have to be delayed a few minutes, you'd have to go back to the president, he'd have to call STRATCOM, uh, which is where the order originated, and the general at STRATCOM would then have to give the order, and that few minutes, was able to slow down the order from the president so that the missile never launched. In you reality, once the president gives the order, the missiles are launching. I'll just, to finish up, the one thing I learned, because it ties in with what Congressman Liu uh, and, and uh, Ben Rhodes were saying, I, I thought that the nuclear football, can, I thought when you opened it up, it's, it's this computer with, the, with, with dials and switches and you put in the codes, no. What I learned is that the nuclear football contains like a bunch of Denny's menus, and it's really <laughs> packed. The, and the menus are each for how to go to nuclear war, every scenario for how the United States could go to nuclear war. So we have three major attack options for, the, for Russia. One major attack option one is where you just kill everybody. You, you attack everything, the civilian and military. I'm sure that it's not exact. Close enough, right? Um, oh, but then major yeah. attack option two Ballpark. is, well, not, you don't kill as many people, but you, you, you take out military. Major attack option three is you just take out military, but there are benefits. Of the, just, it, it's bad. And, but then there's how to attack North Korea, how to attack, I, I, I imagine, every other, you probably have a better say. But, but that I thought was interesting. Um, anyway, that's what I learned. This, stuff can't, this stuff can't be scripted. <laughs> Um, yeah, but actually, my next question is for for Paul Redford. So, um, so you did an episode uh, 
long before Madam Secretary for West Wing about uh, enemies, foreign and domestic, and it um, included some delicate negotiations with the Russian in advance of uh, what's now a rather prescient Helsinki summit. Um, and so I understand that you consulted with Strobe Talbot for that. So along the lines of these incredible people that you know, health and Hollywood Health and Society help put you in contact with to research these episodes that you're doing. But um, Strobe Talbot was the former Deputy Secretary of State, and he uh, remains an expert on uh, diplomacy with Russia. So tell us a little bit about that experience working with him, and how did that inform your episode? Well, as, as we all can tell you, I mean, one of the joys of working on the material we do is the research. And actually, getting on the phone or coming face to face with characters enacting a drama in reality that it's you couldn't script. So, um, you know, Ben is actually in the room, <laughs> the room that we build sets of and write scripts for, and and so many of the best stories on West Wing and Madam Secretary, I think, derived. It would always be the writers. Well, what if? Like every good story. Uh, and then we could go to a Strobe Talbot, a Gene Sperling, Clinton and Gore themselves pitch stories for the West Wing. We could go to the people who had actually been there and hopefully get the nod that yes, that's plausible. And what was even better was afterwards they said, but here's what really happened. And then you'd use that. So um, in this case, I was assigned to do a summit story um, with a Russian president which is sort of close to me because my mother's whole family was, uh, my grandfather died in the gulag, and my mother is a refugee immigrant from Soviet Russia. Um, and, you know, the, the whole Cold War story, which we had come in on the end of in West Wing, it was a post-Cold War White House, but it was still very much we knew writing that character, and Michael, you've played presidents too, they all have in common, <laughs> maybe the latest exception, is that there is one thing they live day and night with, like no other human on Earth, which is the power to end the Earth. And how do you deal with that? And how does Bartlett deal with that? And so Aaron told me, yeah, I, I don't even actually want to do the summit, I want to do the, what happens before the summit. And what does an American president and a Russian president talk about that the world can't see? What can we see that you wouldn't see on CNN or the nightly news? And um, we had a wonderful researcher at the time. We didn't have, uh, <laughs> this, this was 18 years ago. And much, no one was thinking about Iran on any kind of superpower terms in those days. So this, this researcher said, well, you want to talk to Strobe Talbot? And I sort of went, Whoa, and that's when I realized <laughs> that we really were a hit and we really were changing the national conversation. If Strobe Talbot, who's a, rather busy at the time, uh, could take time out of his day to talk to a lowly you know, co-producer, then we, we had a certain respect at that point uh, in Washington. And sure enough, hold for Mr. Talbot, and what do you want to know? And I tried to blurt out what, and they said, okay, and then in, in five minutes, he gave us the whole story. He gave me the whole plot, and I was just frantically scribbling it. And that's when I also realized, and maybe that's why West Wing has been um, my most sort of satisfying, and I've worked with Aaron Sorkin on three different shows, but in, in, in three different areas, uh, Sports Night, Sports Broadcasting, the White House, and the Newsroom. And they're all thrilling, and they're all very good for Aaron's talents, but the West Wing was the best because he was a storyteller writing about storytellers. Because that's what Ben does, that's what Strobe Talbot does, is we as writers have to get Aaron at the end of the table for five minutes and say, here's, here's what would happen if Bartlett did this. Here's what would happen if CJ did this. Ben and Strobe Talbot and the others have to go in the Oval Office and say, okay, Mr. President, here's what would happen if, you know, Iran said this. Here's what would happen if. And that's what Strobe Talbot gave me. He gave me, uh, uh, he said, no one knows about this, but the Russians are building Iran a heavy water reactor. I didn't know what that was. He explained to me what that was and why Iran going nuclear 
was the great threat that no one knew about at the time, except the Russian and the American president. Um, so I, I kind of always wonder if we you know, violated some official secrecy act or something, putting that on the air. Because it was, it was just a perfect dramatic story, and because it was taken from reality. Um, so ever since that, that show, and I think you'd agree, like I said, being face to face with the people who are actually enacting these dramas and not knowing the outcome, because <laughs> that's always the problem with the fictional thing, is the audience knows that you know, we're not going to end with a mushroom cloud. Um, but they don't. So uh, I have huge respect. And I always tell people that show cured me of my cynicism in politics. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, OK, so my last question for the panel here, and I, I want to be more, I, I'm feeling like I want to be more sensitive to time than audience Q&A. So save your questions for on the way out. That's going to upset some people. But I want to be sensitive to time. So my last question is actually for the panel. Um, Maybe one or two of you think about this. With all the writers and uh, storytellers here in the audience tonight, what is that golden nugget? What is that story that's not being told right now? I'll take a crack at that. Um, people are always asking, what can I do? Uh, what, are the, what are the positive stories here? <laughs> what, what's possible? Uh, we've heard about all the horrors, and there are many. Um, I, I've um, often thought that the Women's Peace Camp at Grenham Commons in the UK, a 20-year-old, a 20-year um, protest of nuclear weapons in England, U.S. nuclear weapons that had put, been put in place in 1981 as part of a weapons buildup. Um, that that would be a terrific story because these women live there continuously from 1981 to 2000. Um, and they managed to, uh, one night, break through the fences and get up and dance around on the top of a missile silo that had U.S. nuclear weapons in them. And I think the image of these women dancing on a missile silo and finally, um, contributing to the, to the negotiation of the intermediate nuclear forces. Um, Mikhail Gorbachev apparently heard about these pro those, that protest and others and decided that the West might be you know, interested in getting rid of nuclear weapons. Um, but the story is wonderful. I mean, they dressed up as teddy, you know, as teddy bears and went inside and had a picnic around the missile silos. They um, had lots of intrigue, you know, uh, disagreements, arguments, uh, ideological struggles, but, um, and, you know, wonderfully attractive young women, and it has all the elements of a great story, <laughs> so. All right, good. Ben? Oh, oh yeah. Congressman. I to the elected, uh, Congressman yeah, Lim. Yeah, yeah. uh, well, well, first, uh, so Dave and Paul, whenever you write that episode about a member of Congress saving the world, I'm here. <laughs> I'll put that out there. Um, <laughs> No, but, but seriously, uh, oh, let, me, uh, uh, <laughs> let me say why I'm so thrilled that members of Hollywood are here. Uh, all of you can reach audiences that politicians never can. And so you have a way of reaching the American people uh, in impactful, emotive ways. So thank you for doing that. Uh, I think Michael Douglas is absolutely right. What do you have to do has to be entertaining, because if it's not, no one's going to watch it. So I'll give you an example. I um, screened uh, this show called Fortitude few years ago, it was a crime drama that had elements of climate change in it. And I screened it on Capitol Hill, and the producers kept saying, do not call it ego thriller. No one's going to watch it if you call it that. Um, and when you watch it, it's very clear it's a crime drama that has elements of climate change in it. And so within what you're doing that is entertaining, just putting in questions or storylines that educate the American people can be very helpful. So I'm going to give you one of them to think about. It'd be sort of interesting if you thought about educating American people about low-yield nuclear weapons, exploding one, and what that does, and what, what would a little nuclear weapon do in terms of changing uh, our entire sort of global view of nuclear weapons. So that's my thought for y'all. All right, Ben, last word. I mean, I, I was just going to say the, uh, 
the most important thing to remember about this entire enterprise is it's comprised completely of human beings. Um, they can seem so distant, um, but ultimately government, like anything else, is a human endeavor. Um, that reactor, uh, the Iranians spent 15 years trying to develop a heavy water reactor that could produce plutonium. And when we were in the final stages of the Iran nuclear agreement, they were very close. And we couldn't figure out a way to solve this problem. We couldn't accept a deal in which they had a heavy water reactor that could produce plutonium. They didn't want to destroy the heavy water reactor that they had because they'd invested a lot in it, a very human emotion. And the Iranians put uh, their chief nuclear scientist into the negotiations. And everybody thought this was going to be a big problem because he was a hardliner. He had this reputation in the West as being kind of a, a, a hard ass. Um, and it goes to show we don't know them as well as we think we do, but uh, put that aside. Ernie Moniz was his counterpart, a nuclear physicist. Uh, incredibly eccentric guy, brilliant guy, one of the most brilliant nuclear physicists. And he looks like kind of a founding father. <laughs> and he goes in the negotiations, and it turns out that Ernie Moniz was at MIT at the same time that this guy, uh, the Iranian, had been at MIT before the Shah um, fell. And they had this kind of human scientist kind of chemistry. And they kind of wanted to solve this problem together. Um, and Ernie Moniz showed him, no, we can redesign this entire reactor for you. What you'll have to let us do is rip out the core of the entire reactor and destroy it. So, it, But then we can design something that allows you to have a reactor that, that cannot produce plutonium. But you don't have to bulldoze this whole thing. And that actually was kind of one of the keys to unlocking this whole deal. And it was just a couple of human beings solving a problem and drawing on this long history they had at MIT that I'm sure brought echoes of a time when Americans and Iranians could talk to each other like human beings and not like adversaries. Um, and you know that, that tiny little nugget, uh, and there's thousands of them that happened when I was in government, for good and bad, by the way. Um, you know, Russia was a much different place to deal with when Dmitry Medvedev was president um, than when Vladimir Putin came in. Um, I, I think that the, the, the people here who are creative and who think about as Michael said, stories that, that involve you know, human beings that people can relate to. Well, that's the entire enterprise of government. And human beings every day are making decisions that can lead to peace or can lead to war. Um, and what uh, I think the audience here can do is, is, is show us uh, how this isn't just some distant machine. You know, the Manhattan uh, comment is exactly right. The, the whole national security enterprise is too secretive. And I've been in it, and I've seen all the secrets. But actually, the secrets aren't, you know, I didn't learn that the aliens killed JFK. Like, they're, you, you all know what the secrets are. Like, they're not actually that revelatory, right? I mean, demystifying this for people is important. Because once you realize it, it's just another human being just like me. And everybody who's making these decisions put their pants on one leg at a time in the morning, you know, um, except Trump, who, uh, you know, uh, but put that aside. Um, Don't go there. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that that's the first step to making people feel like they have agency. Yeah. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking this incredible panel tonight and our special guests up front.